Uh, now we'd like to do a quick icebreaker so that you can meet the people around you who you probably already met during our, our long break before this. Uh, but our speaker came up with tonight's icebreaker, which is, uh, what is your favorite, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Battlestar Galactica? So take a few minutes and let's come up with an answer. There are some oofs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, can we get a show of hands? Who went for Star Wars? What about Star Trek? What about Battlestar Galactica? Okay. So, we've got supporters for all of them. Awesome. Okay, this month in data science, I uh, wanted to make you an, aware that there's a PyCon Canada event happening. It's November 16th to 17th in Toronto. And uh, the deadline for the call for proposals is at the end of this month, August 31st. And there is a Pi data track that you can uh, submit papers to. Also, make you aware of next month's speaker, Katie Bauer, will be speaking on building time on site at Reddit. And that will be Wednesday, September 11th, here again at 6 o'clock. Uh, now we have some time for community announcements. So if anyone has anything they want to share with the group, um, if you have, if you're looking for talent or if you're looking for a job, now's your time to stand up and uh, share it with the group. Go ahead. Great. One more. Yeah, a few more. Dan, I'm looking for a, a recruiter. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm looking for a, like mid-tier data science talent for someone who wants to work in Detroit. Oh, very cool. Right here. Uh, I'm Edward. I work at a, um, a research lab at the University of Michigan, and we're hiring kind of entry-level data scientists to work with medical imaging data as well as automotive data. So here's that. Wow. Neat. In the back? Yep. Yep. Um, I'm looking for a job uh, in possibly with uh, Python, and uh, I have a background in image processing and pattern recognition, and uh, about 15 patents in the area. Uh -huh. Good. A few other things. My, my background is um, applied math, and I've been involved with uh, code development over the years. Anyway, I'm trying to move to a new uh, career, so anyway. Great, and what's your name? Peter Smith. Peter Smith, great. Any more, any more? Sean? I got two things. Uh, number one, there is a Pi Data New York conference coming up. I think it's November 4th to 6th. The call for proposals is uh, ends in August 31st, so submit something there if you're interested in giving a talk. I've been there for the past two years. It's a great event, a great location, right in the heart of uh, Times Square in uh, New York. Uh, second thing, I'd like to thank Patricia for being our, our great host for the past uh, year. So let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, tonight's my night, my last night with Pi Data Ann Arbor, um, moving to Oregon for a job at Intel. So this was great. I've loved it here. I hope we all stay in touch. <laughs> um, any other community uh, announcements? Dan? Python, Postgres, and Tableau. I've got experience uh, visualizing things. In automotive, I do sports analytics. Um, I'm looking for the next gig, but most open to uh, long-term jobs. Great. One more. Hi, I'm Alex. Um, I did a master's in math, PhD computer science, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Michigan right now to reading machine learning with medical data. Uh, and recently decided to start looking at industry jobs. Excellent. Well, thanks again for everyone sharing, and I hope you can all connect after uh, the, the night is over. All right, so I'm going to pass this off now to Clayton, who will introduce our speaker. Before I do that, I'm also hiring. Uh, I work at EverActive, and we do uh, time series and sensor data from uh, Internet of Things sensors. So I'm looking for a senior data scientist. So if that sounds like something of interest, uh, find me after all this. So a huge thanks to Patricia, Sean, Rose, and Ben for, oh, can you not hear me? Thank you. Um, a huge thanks to Pi Data for allowing this R group to co-host this meetup. Not only am I a co-organizer of the R meetup, but so is uh, Zhao Song, Andrew, and Ellis over there. Um, and so yeah, a big thanks to them for, for putting this all together for us. 
I'm even more excited to uh, announce or to introduce uh, Jacqueline Nolis, our speaker tonight. She's a principal data scientist at Nolis LLC, and you might know her from her uh, very popular Twitter, uh, Sky Tetra. She um, is also writing a book, which I suspect you'll hear a little bit about tonight. She was the winner of season three of the reality show King of the Nerds. <laughs> and um, I'm a particularly big fan of her because of her less than safe for work articles on things like analyzing sex survey data and doing deep learning to generate offensive license plates. So I definitely suggest, <laughs> I definitely suggest uh, going and digging up those. And she also gave a very good talk at uh, the last R Studio conference, which was in January on doing API development with R and TensorFlow. It was one of the best talks uh, there for certain. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, this is Jacqueline. Thank you. You know, what's really funny about that not safe for work analysis because you really want to go to conferences and talk about them. But like that code of conduct said no sexual material in con conference talks. And you got to balance that. That's a tricky game to play. So anyway, uh, so hi, I'm Jacqueline Nolis. And I'm here today to talk about when data science projects fail. Um, so a little bit about me. We kind of covered it already, but I've been a data scientist for over 10 years. Um, I'm currently, I co-founded a data science consulting company with my wife, which is what I do now. Uh, before that, I was director of analytics at a consulting firm called Lenati. Before that, I was the lead of an anal analytics at a consulting firm called Promontory um, that did bank consulting. Um, I have a PhD in industrial engineering. I won a reality TV show. And for fun, I like making funny data science models. Um, on the right here, you'll see just a couple of the companies I've worked with, uh, T-Mobile, Expedia, Microsoft, Airbnb. <laughs> um, so the, <laughs> there's a lot going on here that I can talk about about me. But I put that in quotes because like, <sighs> was that actually about me? Um, you know, that, that slide, it really sounded prestigious. But like, if you looked at that slide, you'd be like, wow, that person, they haven't had any difficulties ever, right? Like, look at all their successes. Right? You know, people I think talk about, especially in the data science community, we have a tendency to talk a lot about our successes. Here's the cool projects I've done. Here's the cool roles I've had. Here's the TV shows I've been on. Maybe that one's a little less common. But you know, we talk about a lot about our successes, and we don't really talk about our failures. And you know, talking about failure is hard. It makes you feel vulnerable. You have to show weakness. And so like, I kind of get it. But I think this is a real problem with data science as a community. And so well, well what is even a failure? Um, well, it's to me, and you could define this a bunch of ways, but when I think about a data science failure, I think, you know, it's when you set out to do a data science task, but you are unable to complete it. And that could be something like, hey, you can't even find the data in the first place. If your churn model re relies on getting historic order data, maybe that data isn't saved by your company. Um, maybe you can't get, maybe you get the data, but then your model doesn't actually end up fitting. You know, your R squared is 0.2 or whatever, and you're like, this can't actually be used. Or maybe you make the model. It works. The data uh, is sufficient. You, you have this model. And for whatever reason, the stakeholders don't end up using it. And so sure, you've technically completed your task as a data scientist of building a model. But if it never gets used, then that's not really a success. Because success means that your work, you know, data science job isn't to just build models for fun. They have to actually be used. So projects can fail in a lot of different ways. And failing is the worst. It's the worst. Why? Well, first off, it hurts, right? Because you work on a task for so long, and hopefully this like isn't triggering people in the audience. Like, yeah, this has hurt me in the past. But you know, these hurt, right? Like, you think about these projects you worked on so long, and you've tried so hard to succeed at them, you haven't, and so it makes you feel inside like, hey, maybe you know, maybe there's something wrong. It's embarrassing, right? If you have to talk to you know your boss, other people about, hey, this thing I set out to do, I couldn't do. It's very easy to make that feel like a, a sign of weakness, and so that's scary. And also, it ends your fun projects. If you're doing the super cool natural language processing thing for a year, and well, it's still not quite working yet, you know, it's really fun to just add a whole another year on and keep on working on it because it's fun, you know, even if that doesn't mean that your project's you know, actually going to succeed. Um, so failing is not great. But it's important that we learn from our failures. And you know, when I was a junior employee, this happened all the time. And when I'm a senior employee, this happens all the time, which is my brain tells me, you know, Man, if I was only a better data scientist, then I wouldn't have failed at this, right? If I was a better data scientist, if I just knew that one more technique that I haven't read yet, then the project wouldn't have failed. The model would have converged. The data would have been good enough. And so in my head, I just would always, during my career, have this notion of just the more, you know, if I was only better, if I was only something else, then the project would have been okay. But, you know, these failures, 
Talking about these failures, even if that's true, they can give us great insight into what can go wrong. You know, as we talk about our failures, we can understand what are the things we should look out for the next time. What can we learn from it? But to do that, it requires vulnerability. We have to be comfortable with our emotions about failure and understanding the hurt. You know, it requires vulnerability in a career sense, right? If you're a junior employee, you don't want to go to a conference and have your first talk be about how you didn't succeed at something, right? Like, there's a real career risk there. And so, you know, it's hard as a junior employee, it's less hard as a senior employee. But like, for me, even making this presentation was kind of scary because I'm going to talk about some of my failures and like, I don't know, maybe you guys would have hired me as a consultant and won't, right? Like, I don't know, these thoughts going through my head and it's terrifying. But at the end of the day, these failures happen everywhere all the time in data science. I highly suspect that like 90% of the people in the room can like think right now of a project you worked on that did not succeed. Um, so they're really out there all the time. Um, so this is just something that we have to deal with. So I, um, I've been data science for years. I've been thinking a lot about projects failing. And eventually I'm like, you know what? I failed a lot. I'm going to do what you do when you have a lot of emotions and it's you write a blog post. Um, so I wrote a blog post at one point. I'm like, I'm going to take all my feelings of failure and I'm going to put them out in a blog post. And I wrote this blog post. Um, I think it was like a year ago. Yeah, a year ago. And, um, and I just talked about, you know, what are some of the ways projects can, can fail? How can you handle that? And I, I write a fair amount of blog posts. This one is one of my best KPI'd blog posts ever. It seems like a lot of data science click on it. So, you know, this is probably not just something I have to deal with. Um, so, confession for the Pi data people, um, I'm an R user primarily. And so in the R community, the best possible thing that can happen to you on Twitter is that a guy named Hadley Wickham retweets your article. And so that happened to me. So I'm like, yes, I made it. I'm not a failure. Um, but there's a twist. And I look back on this, present, this blog post now, a year later, and throughout the blog post, I barely mention the failures I actually had. So in the blog post, I talk about all the ways you can fail, all the things you should look out for to try and succeed. But I never talk about my own failures. So I don't even do the thing I talked about in a couple slides ago about actually showing the emotional vulnerability and talking about where we have failed. And so today I'd like to rectify that. For the next few minutes, we're going to go through my top five failures. And why are we going to do that? Well, it's important to learn from mistakes, right? I think that by going through some of the projects that I've done during my career that have been failures, we can all kind of maybe understand a little bit better why these projects can fail. Another reason is, you know, it shows another side of me. It shows that I'm not just a person who always succeeds at everything. Um, I fail a lot all the time. And it's important that junior data scientists understand that senior data scientists do this too. It's not just something that happens early in a career. Um, and lastly, uh, my hope is that if I'm more comfortable talking about my failures, then you all might be more comfortable talking about your failures too. And you may be able to talk to other people going forward about some of the places that you weren't able to succeed at what you set out to do. So with that, let's do it. Let's, show, let's go through my top five failures. Um, so number one, here we go, the Adler alert. Um, I really like this one. Um, OK, so this is me. I'm a month into a new job very early in my career, don't know very much about how industry works, month in this new job. I'm working at an e-commerce company. And this is a company that's primarily powered by a website. And on this website, like a month before I joined the company, they had a bug. And normally when your company has a bug on their website, you notice because you get like error reports and devs, DevOps sees things. And that's what you notice. But what happened was this company noticed the bugs because the people in marketing saw that sales were lower than they expected. And then they called up the software engineers and said, figure out what's going on. And then days later, they fixed it and lost millions of dollars. And the people in marketing were not happy, right? Because if you're in marketing, you do not want your job to be noticed problems with the website. That's bad. And so one of the executives from the marketing department came to my organization, specifically, it trickled down to me with like, hey, I'm executive of this company. This bug happened on a Tuesday. Send me the last eight Tuesdays worth of sales. I want to see how this Tuesday compared to other ones so we can notice if there's a problem. And so I realized that this executive was trying to do some sort of like signal analysis thing of like, how can you tell when there's a problem? But to me, the executive was setting out all wrong, right? You don't want to just look at eight Tuesdays. What you really want to do is think much more thoughtfully of all the different ways that you can try and predict what should happen today, right? So each day, sales were growing a little bit over and over because the company was growing. Uh, there's also holiday seasonality, right? So if you're in a Christmas season, it might behave differently than if you are in other parts of the year. There's like a hundred of these little tiny things that should really go into affecting of, well, if we're at $900,000 in sales today, is that low enough that we should have maybe a check if there's a bug on there? And so you don't want to just look at like eight Tuesdays. You want to build a whole tool to this, to do this. And so I'm like 
really early in my career, I'm like, I'm just going to build something to do it. And so what I did was I took some statistical quality control techniques and some time series analysis techniques, and I put them together to create a signal detection or an anomaly detection service. And the executives saw this. They're like, this is great. They bought in. They got a team of people to work on it, and I was leading them. And ultimately, so my maiden name was um, Adler. And so early on in my career, I didn't know what you don't want to have happen is you get a product named after you. But this product got named after me. And this is terrible. It's terrible for two reasons. One, it makes you look super arrogant, um, which is bad. Um, two, what's worse is that every time something goes wrong with it, they know who to call, and it's you. <laughs> so that happened to me. And so normally when I talk about this project and presentations like this, this is where I stop. And we laugh, and we think, oh, wow, Jacqueline did a cool thing and led a team early in the career. It's all cool. And so it seems like a great success. But actually, this project was a failure. And the reason why was we built this tool that was this time series, an anomaly detection service. But what happened was we then said, OK, instead of just looking at sales over time, let's also look at you know, orders, revenue, average order value, um, conversion rates. And let's do it not just for one region of the company, but for all the different regions. And so pretty soon, we're trying to predict 20 different KPIs. And you know, if you have 20 KPIs and you have 95% confidence, that means every day one of them should be sending off an alert, which is really bad. Um, and then, so, and so then, even if your signal service is really good and ours is OK, and you still have problems. And then I'm like, OK, I'm early in my career. The UI I'm going to decide to make, because UIs aren't important. You don't need to worry about that. The hard part's the model, was I'm going to make an Excel spreadsheet that has a color where one is colored green and has a high color, and red is, is, is 0, and that's bad. And you get this sheet that has each row as a day. And then you just look at what today's date is, and you try and figure out what's going on. And the problem is, that is impossible to figure out what's going on, right? Like, is, is a red a problem? Sure. Is an orange a problem? Is a light orange a problem? Right? Like, there's no way to interpret this quickly if you're a business executive. And so this UI was incomprehensible. Um, and it's just we tried to do too many things at once with this tool. And then ultimately, this project got scrapped. So we didn't end up using it. So despite the cool techniques, the cool model, Real time, whatever, it didn't work and it wasn't used. And that taught me something very early in my career, which is projects can fail when the work isn't implemented well. So even if the work is done really well, when it comes time to implement it, to create the UI for it, to create the API, whatever, that can kill it. And so it's really important as data scientists that we don't just get really stuck on the models and the data, but we think really heavily about what's going to happen after that, um, because that can really cause a project to fail. OK, so that's failure number one. Let's keep going. Uh, so number two, a full customer analysis. So pretty early in my career, I switched from working in industry to consulting. And I was doing some consulting for a retail company. And this company, they had years of data, orders, sales, customer calls, whatever. They had just years, great data. They had in-store surveys. They had data on which emails customers clicked and what they bought after that. They had great data. But what they never had was a data scientist at their company. And so I was there consulting as a data scientist, very excited. And they said, hey, you know, we read all these articles about how great data science is and how important it is and data is new oil, whatever, whatever. Can you do some data science on this data and find what's useful for us? And so I said, yeah, sure. I, that is what I do. I find relationships and things. Um, and so I took that data. I joined the data together. And I found all these different connections between different parts of these different data sets. And that's the Jacqueline's a success part. And now let's, let's go to the, the twist. This is an embarrassing failure. And why was that? Because I did all this work, and I walked into this room full of executives at this retail company, and I showed them a bunch of stuff that was really useless to them. Some of the things I found were like, hey, customer, this type of high value customer X buys this type of product Y. And they're like, yeah, we know. We walk around the store, and we see them do that every day. Like, that doesn't help us. And I'd be like, OK, OK, okay here's, how about this? Lots of your customers, like really only 20% of your customers come back a second time. And they're like, yeah, we know that too. We see, like, we, we see people not come back. What can we do to fix that problem? And I'm like, like I don't work in retail. I don't know. And so I'd <laughs> right? And so like, this is the kind of stuff I would do, where I'd have a chart that shows on the bottom, 1 to 10, what was your likelihood to recommend the company? So like how, net promoter score style, style thing. And this would be the probability that in, when you were surveyed in store, you said the service was good. And it's like, look at that relationship. And it's like, yeah, oh my god. If you say this, you're going to recommend the company, you also probably think the service is good, right? Like, <laughs> and so this is incredibly embarrassing for me, that I put all this data science work into a project, and then I walked into a room of people, and it just totally fell flat. 
And so the lesson I learned here is that projects can fail without a clear objective. So I don't think that data science was wrong. I don't think the report was wrong. I think the problem was that I walked into that, walked in on that first day starting to do data science without actually having a clear objective except find things. And I think it's very easy as data scientists to want to do this, right? You get a new data set. It's interesting. You want to find the, the hidden signals in there. But if you don't actually have a clear objective of what you're going to do with it, it's very unlikely you will just happen to find something that is so interesting it will alter the business. So it really helps as much as possible when you start a data science project to have that clear objective. Number three. Ah, oh, I don't know. I keep like smiling when I see the new ones. I think of all the trauma. So here we go. Um, so I was working, uh, I was consulting for a large company. And this company, they were releasing lots of applications, right? Mega corporation, very large, have all sorts of applications they set out. And one of the things they did, being a smart company, is before they released a new version of an app, they had humans test it. So they ended up having like a floor of a building just filled with people like testing apps and making sure that every part of the app worked right. And specifically what they did was they had a list of tests. Right, they have like 100, 200, some number of tests, and they have to go through each test and make sure, yes, the app passed this test. Yep, the app passed this test. But also, these apps create a lot of telemetry. So every time you do something in the app, like press a button, it would actually send that data to the server that you press that button. And so you might have an app telemetry with things like, oh, at this time, the app started, and then this button was clicked, and then it actually successfully connected to the server, and, and you have like giant, giant logs of this. And so the idea, was what if we use the telemetry created from the app to tell if it would pass the tests or not, right? So if you could, if there was a test in here that was the app successfully starts and stops, and you saw in the telemetry the app start and app stop uh, telemetry actions and events, then you might not need to have a human actually manually check that yourself. And so this project was a, a work from a combination of the quality assurance team, so the people who manage those, that floor full of people and the tests, and the data science team, which I was a member of, or the, you know, the people who would come in and try, and try and automate some of this. So these two teams are going to work together and try and automate this quality assurance. So I got brought into the project part of the way through it. And me, th when I saw it three days in, I'm like, oh my god, this project will never succeed. And it was like, you know, maybe part of that was just shock of getting in the middle of it. Um, and maybe if I'd been at the start, it might have been different. But I was really discouraged. And the reason why was, um, you know, as a data scientist, it's really important to not just look at data. And so the, one of the first things I did was I actually spent hours pouring through each one of those like 200 tests and all the different uh, definitions of it and requirements. And most of the tests ended up being things like there were correct grammars in the app's menu, right? So like the apps actually, like when you clicked on a menu, the grammar in there was good. And if you think about telemetry, app start, app stop, things like that, there's almost no way it would include what words were in the menu. And even if it did, getting a machine learning model to actually tell if that grammar was good is itself a hard problem, too. And so of those terabytes of telemetry from the apps, little of it actually related to the tests that were involved. Most of them were things like, is the uh, processor on the computer at the right temperature? Things like that. So only a few of the tests could be plausibly automated. Like, for instance, you could imagine there's a test like, there exists telemetry for this app. And like, OK, sure, maybe that one could be automated. <laughs> Probably. But even when we did, um, the models that we created for these, they often had an intolerable accuracy, right? So if you're talking about an app being released to the public, you want to be like positive it passes all these tests. And if your machine learning model that reads the telemetry can only be like 80% accurate, or like only agree with what a human would say 80% of the time, that's probably not sufficient for this to actually succeed as a project. And these things could all be told very early on into the project, right? You don't need to spend months and months and months before you notice all of these things. But the problem, project did go for months and months, and it went on for over a year, year. It ended up being a, a prisoner's dilemma, a, a Nash equilibrium, if you will. And so there were two teams. There's a quality assurance team and the data science team. And if, you're, if you have two teams and one says, this isn't going to work, the other team gets to say, why aren't you a team player? Of course it's going to work. You just need to stick with it. And that team looks good, and the naysayer team looks bad. Um, and so what ends up happening is neither team wants to be the naysayers. They both want to be the, of course this will work if we just try a little harder. Um, and so what ends up happening is you get this um, Nash equilibrium where you're just continuing on this project over and over, even though everyone knows it's not going to work. And that's not really great. Um, and so I learned that this data science project, I would say it failed ultimately because of poor leadership, right? People could have quickly decided this project should have been scrapped, but it wasn't. It went on and on and on, and that's a real failure. But you could also say the project failed because the signal was hard to detect and the noise, right? You couldn't find the 
you couldn't make a model that could accurately predict the test based on those terabytes of data. There really just wasn't a signal there. Um, and that's bad. Um, OK, number four. Um, so this is a project I did in my personal time. So back when the, the, the website Kickstarter is a website where you can go to, and there are these campaigns where people come up with a, like, an idea for a product, and people pledge money to it. And if enough people pledge money to it, the product the, gets launched, and everyone gets a copy of it, like a board game or a water bottle. Um, and it's a very popular website. And what happens is the campaign needs to hit a certain threshold to, to succeed. And so someone made a different website that would actually analyze data from the Kickstarter website and tell you part of the way through a campaign if that project is going to succeed. So if our water bottles need $50,000 to succeed and we're 10 days in and we've sold, we've earned $10,000 on those water bottles, do we think that project's going to succeed or not? And so what that alternate website did to do the predictions was actually fairly simple. It was something like, well, if it's been 10 days and we've earned $10,000 and there's 20 days left, let's assume we will earn $20,000 on, on those days and then sum that all up and say, well, we'll earn $30,000 total and not have that project succeed. Um, so it's basically assuming a constant amount of revenue each day. And so when I thought about this, I'm like, well, there's two things we probably can assume. One is that actually when the project is launched, everyone gets excited about it. It goes viral. Hey, cool, a new water bottle is for sale. And so there's probably a big bump at the beginning of the campaign. And similarly, near the end, oh, we're only one day left from being closed, and we need $50,000 to get these water bottles, and we're at 48000 So everyone put in extra money. Like, you can imagine there's a boost at the end, too. So I'm assuming, like, I figured there's probably two humps in this. And so I said, hey. So I emailed this person out of the blue. I said, hey, love your website. I'm a data scientist, love making data analyses and forecasts. Can I try and take your data and analyze it to see if I can do better? And I could not. <laughs> Um, so I spent weeks on this, and what ended up happening was my model had these assumptions that there's a hump at the beginning and the end, but it turns out that's often not true. Sometimes some project only had the hump at the end, some only have it at the beginning, some have one in the middle when a news article went out. And so my model was really having difficulty with these. And what I would do is I'd add on feature after feature. Okay, what if we make a feature that's the first 10 days of the forecast? What if it's the last one? What if, and so I made this model more and more complicated. And eventually, after the model got sufficiently complicated, I did... In aggregate, I would do slightly better than that flat line rule. But it only barely beat that basic rule, and it was immensely complicated. You couldn't really explain how it worked, because it's super complicated. It, um, you know, it just, oftentimes it still did worse on particular cases. And um, I did it in R, and so like to deploy it, you'd have to have like R installed on the server, and I didn't at the time know anything about making APIs. And so it was this complicated mess, and I basically emailed the person back and be like, look, here's what I did, ha <laughs> And I never got any reply to that. Um, I probably wouldn't have replied either, so I get it. Um, but it was really disappointing to me because I really set out in that to think, I'm a data scientist. This is a very clear data set. I can make a great model, and things will go great, and it did not. Um, and so the lesson I learned here is be prepared for your models to not be accurate, right? No matter how clear you think the data set might be, you never know when it's actually a data set that's not very, that doesn't have a signal in there. And this is probably, of all the projects in this, this is the one that haunts me the most of like, you know, I still look at this presentation and be like, well, maybe I should open up that data set one more time now that I know new techniques and see if I can do it again. But like, that's not a good idea. Like, you got to move on from stuff. And I think I needed to just let go that like, at that, you know, really, I just wasn't able to succeed at that one, even though it seems like it was fairly straightforward. And that's OK. OK, last, uh, a retail customer simulation. So retail companies like Nordstrom's, Sears, Macy's, whatever, um, often they have trouble understanding the effects of coupons, discounts, or rewards. So if you're a company, you're Nordstrom, and you want to put out a coupon, $20 off your next purchase, it's really hard to figure out how valuable that's going to be, right? Because you don't know, well, if I give people that coupon, how many more people will come in because of that coupon? And if they come in, how much more spending would they have made had they not had that coupon? And there's all these weird interrelated effects because if you actually just look at historic sales when you had like previous coupons, you never know if the people who came in to use the coupons were your best-selling customers who would have bought more anyway. And so it's just like, it's a real thing to untangle to try and find the value of these different programs. And so typically what happens is it's financially modeled in Excel. So what, what business people will do is they'll make an Excel spreadsheet and they'll say, okay, we think we're going we're gonna to give out 50,000 coupons. We think 10,000 of those coupons will actually be used. 
for each coupon, we're going to assume people spend $50 more for a purchase. And they do these multiplications until they get what they think is the value of the coupon, giving it out. Um, but I, as a consultant doing data science, was like, we surely can do better. And what I thought about is, what if we did a simulation? right? So for each customer, let's actually simulate the orders they make next. So if I have a customer, let's, let's use some machine learning to try and predict what's their next order going to be, and the one after that, and one after that. And how are all these orders going to change because of a coupon? And if I can do these simulations for all customers, and I can do it for all customers, and I can then aggregate that up, that should tell me the value of the coupon. And so I spent months creating a tool to do this. And what it would do is it would actually have a sequence of different machine learning models. And what you do is for each customer, you'd say, OK, I've just made an order. I'm going to look and use, a, like, let's say, a regression to say what is the amount of time it will take for their next purchase. And because I want some randomness in there, I won't just take the exact optimal prediction from the regression. I'll add some noise to that. And I'll do the same thing for that order size and a couple other factors. And from there, I'll make a huge sequence of orders. And then I will adjust that for what happens if there's a coupon on there. I'll say, well, the coupon's going to make this order 10% bigger, which is going to make the next one 10% faster, blah, blah, blah. You do that for the simulation for everyone, and you roll it all up. And so I built this tool, and real companies paid real money to use it, which was like the coolest thing ever for me um, at the time. I'm like, oh my god, my work really has value. Um, but there's a twist. Uh, so what would happen is after every client used it, They'd be like, well, you know, this is interesting. And this, this forecast seems good, but we don't really get why it's making it. And you know, you know could, you just, could you just take what you did and like, put it in some simple Excel formulas we can give to finance? And I was like, I just spent months trying to not do that. Oh my god. And so what I realized in those moments was that really what these clients didn't want, what they did not want, is a prediction of ROI return on investment. They didn't want that. They say they did, but they didn't. What they really want is the smallest amount of work necessary to prove to finance that what they want to do is a good idea. right? And so all you need to do is prove that the company will not get bankrupt by this coupon, and you have a success. And so anything about simulations, you know, big data, blah, 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 all that stuff is just making it more difficult for finance to accept it. And so what would happen is that we do all this, like, a client might be interested and in buy into the service by using the model, but we'd ultimately still have to do the same financial modeling as before. And so this ended up you know, largely being a failure. And I think what I learned from this is make sure you understand what a customer needs. You know, it was very easy to be in my kind of consulting high chair and be like, ah, machine learning is better, accuracy is better, we will do that. And what I should have recognized very early on is the client was finance. Finance really likes things they can understand. And you know, had I talked to finance people a little bit more, had I done a little bit quicker of an MVP instead of building this huge product, I probably would have more quickly realized that this huge product was not really a good idea. Um, but it was really fun. So, uh. <laughs> okay. So those are my five failures, and you know, I learned a lot from them. And I talked about some of the lessons in each one. But what are the sort of themes that I got from putting all these different failures together? So one, lots of projects fail. Um, so for me, I think it's like 75% of my projects fail, something like that, some very high number. It's definitely more than half. Um, and the reason why I think that is the case is because data science, like it's not software engineering, it's mostly research and development, right? If you have a machine learning model, you're asked to build on a new data set. No one's ever done that before. And in a sense, you're researching, is it even possible to use this you know, this order data to predict if these customers will churn, right? That's a research question. You are trying to get a research answer. Um, so it's very, you know, it's very hard to know that in advance without trying to do stuff, trying to do it yourself. And so in that way, data science is like built on the idea that you're going to try stuff. And because you're trying all this new stuff, it often won't work. And that's OK. That's part of the process. I think there are really three big types of data science failures that I've dealt with. One, there's not enough data to deal with. Two, there's not a signal. And three, it's not right for the customer. So not enough relevant data. And I didn't talk too much about these in my top five failures, but I've had plenty of these too, which is you set out to do a project, and it turns out there's not even the data there for it. right? Like Maybe you want to do that churn model, and it turns out you don't actually have order data for the relevant customers. And you don't know that until you actually started on the project. Um, this often happens because it's not well collected. Like for instance, um, there are plenty of places where companies only keep records, like you know, only keep people's current emails, but not what their email was previously before they changed it, or you know, other things like that where they don't keep historic versions. Um, sometimes it's impossible to collect, right? There's a lot of analyses for retail companies, especially, that'd be really well suited if you knew what customers were spending at other companies too, 
right? If you're Macy's, you want to, like, knowing how much these customers also spent at Nordstrom would be great. But you can't get that data. And there's really no way you will ever get that data. Um, and then the data might be within your company, but it might be disjoint over many systems. So um, you, know, you may have the data, but this part's in one database, and this part's in another, and this part's in another, and they all use different keys, and these people are kind of being mean about giving you access to the data. And so while the data might exist, it might be so difficult to obtain that it's not worth the amount of time it would take to invest in getting it. And so generally, the fixes are collecting new data, if you can possibly do that, or finding alternate data in your company. But these are tricky to pull off. Uh, if there's not a signal on the data, um, if, like, if there's too much noise, like you know, in the case of telemetry, where there's so much stuff that's basically garbage, you can't figure out what is interesting, um, or sometimes it never existed. And the case I like to use is if you had a boss, and your boss says, roll a six-sided die 10,000 times, and you do it. And you write down each time what the die roll was in order. Um, and then your boss says to you, OK, great. Now build a machine learning model to predict what the next roll of the die will be. No matter how good you are as a data scientist, you will not be able to predict anything better than a 1 6 chance because there's no signal in there. It never existed. And I think that happens a lot where we assume that, oh, surely whether or not someone is going to leave our company can be seen by what orders they make. But you never know. Maybe people leave your company because they're all moving to another state. I don't know, right? Like there's just lots of cases where it's things you suspect to be inside the data aren't there. And so this can be fixed by finding, maybe if you can find better data sources, you can fix it. But often, what, like, often you start with the best, right? You usually don't start with the second best. Um, so again, this is tricky to pull off. And lastly, things may not be right for the customer. So one, it wasn't validated. So like my situation with that simula uh, simulation tool, I didn't really go through and validate that this would be something that was useful for the customers. Um, another big problem is there's no stakeholder. So I think it's very natural as a data science team to be like, you know, it would be cool. If we had a churn model based on our orders, that'd be really cool. And so you build it, and you have this cool churn model, and then you're like, OK. And then no one in the company actually cares, right? They're like, we, don't, we, can, just predict, um, we can just predict whether or not a customer is going to churn. If they haven't purchased in 12 months, and it's fine. We don't need your tool. We don't get it. And so it really is important to have, as much as possible, have someone who is interested in the product you're going to make before you start, not after it is done. And then lastly, politics. I mean, this is true at any company, but sometimes it's just your data science team is competing with a data engineering team, or I don't know. Like, there's all these different things that can go on. And you know, it's just like the weather. Data scientists don't really have that much control over it. Um, the best thing in these situations you can do is try and change the product to be better for the customer. But again, these are all difficult things to make um, during a project. But it's important to make the best of it. Um, so if you can think about, for each one of like, the projects that fail, like what successes you can get out of it, uh, you can help avoid problems in the future. Uh, so this tweet by Dewey Koning uh, talked about how on her team, you know, they actually did a, uh, a situ they had a situation where they wrote down some of the successes they got from a failed project. And they realized they actually had quite a few. And for me, one of the situations that's happened was with that Adler alert, with that, that green and red rug of uh, ambiguity. Um, so that tool was ultimately not useful. But what was useful was the original algorithm we then tried to, we then put into a, a simple Excel tool so, uh, so marketing executives could see each day how much they were going to make. And so that wasn't as ambitious as the original project, but like we were able to salvage something out of it. And sometimes that can happen on projects you've failed with. Uh, also, cutting and running is great. Um, so failing projects can have a drag on a team. Um, so that is to say, if you have a team of five data scientists and two or three of them are working on a project that is clearly not going anywhere and they're, they need to spend months and months more before it maybe goes somewhere, oftentimes the best thing to do is just say, nope, this is not worth the, um, the time. And that's because it's a huge opportunity cost, right? Every project that a data scientist is working on that is probably going to fail is that data scientist could be working on something new and having more potential. And so it's very easy in this field to have the sunk cost fallacy of like, well, we put so much time into it. Let's just put a little bit more. But the quicker and more comfortable you can get between iterating um, through different ideas, the better. And I think software development, like startups are really good at this, the idea of like pivoting and fail fast, fail often. Like I think that is kind of important for data science too. Like don't get stuck on one project because it seems really cool for too long if it doesn't seem like it's going to pan out. Um, ah, this was supposed to animate. That's okay. Okay, so um, so at the start of my career, I really believed that data scientists were like uh, carpentry or like building a house. So here you have a data scientist, and they're building a house. And I guess building a house has to do with cutting wood. I don't really know. I've never built a house, but but you build <laughs> you build a house, and 
It's really important if you're a carpenter building a house that that house is sturdy and solid and everyone depends on it and you meet the specifications and then you're done with it and you move on. And that's like a house. And then a senior data scientist, they're not just building houses, they're building skyscrapers, right? They've done so many years of this, they know how to add floors and elevators and features, but these are super stable, very reliable. If a skyscraper fell over, that person would be fired and never have a job again. Um, and so as a data scientist, I thought your job was to never let your building fall over. So every task you were assigned to, you were supposed to succeed at within specifications and move on. So that's how I thought the world worked at the start of my career. And here's what I think the work world works like now. So now I think data scientists, they're like treasure hunters in a cave, right? And if you're a junior data scientist treasure hunting, or I guess in, a, in, a, in an island because there's a tree, I guess. Um, you're, you're, you have a simple map and you're trying to navigate the small space, but like you're trying to look for something very hard to find, success. And a senior data scientist, it's the same thing, only with a bigger map. There's more dragons, there's whales, more islands, whatever. But at the end of the day, if you are a treasure hunter and you've found treasure twice, you are a legendary treasure hunter, right? Treasure hunters are, like, it's extremely hard to find treasure. If you set out to find treasure and you don't, no one is surprised. Um, and so it's really an exploratory thing. And it's not like a data scientist is, um, you know, like a senior data scientist is more likely to succeed at finding treasure. It's just that they, because they're senior, they're maybe going to set out on the harder, trying to find the harder treasures, but they still not, don't find treasure all the time. So actually finding treasure is fantastic. And we should be really excited about that. And then lastly, that thought I had at the beginning, if you were a better data scientist, you wouldn't have failed. Um, I kind of realized this is, um, this should be replaced with the idea of like, hey, if you aren't failing as a data scientist, you probably aren't taking enough risks. If every one of your models works, if every one of your analysis is a, is a, like, lands perfectly, that's probably a sign that your analyses aren't ambitious, that your models are on extremely clear data. And so it's important to embrace the idea that like, you, you should be having failures because otherwise you're not having big enough successes. You're not really going out of your comfort zone. And you know, at first I kind of thought of this as, um, like almost like imposter syndrome, right? Like imposter syndrome is the idea that like, oh, I'm secretly, like I'm actually a terrible data scientist and no one, or everyone's gonna realize it and everyone knows I'm secretly bad. But like, I think very good, people who are very comfortable in how good they are as data scientists can have these sort of thoughts too. But it really, it's not about whether or not you're good or bad data scientists, it's the idea that you're the weakest link, right? The reason why the project failed was you, right? It's not the data, it's not the model, it's because you didn't know enough things. And it's about this mental image that you are the weakest link and everything's relying on you and you are the thing that snapped and fell apart. And I think that's really wrong now as a more senior person. And I think it's almost like weirdly arrogant, right? Like the idea that like, oh, the project would have succeeded if it were not for me. Like, no, like you can't control politics. You can't make data better. You can't make single in there. The idea that like, the idea that you're the thing that's stopping all that, like that, it's not right. Like you can't hold yourself to that level of accountability. It's insanity. And so I realized I had a lot of this in my career, this weakest link syndrome that like I had to be better and I was a big problem. And like one of the things I've really tried to do as much as I can as a senior data scientist who's like, you know, just been around a little bit is just really get comfortable with the idea that like projects fail for lots of reasons. I have to accept that and I can't blame myself for all of it. So with that, I um, encourage you guys to all go forth, be more comfortable failing, talking about failing. I'm really trying to work on that myself. Um, and I have a few last slides on this. So one, if you're like, oh, this is great. I really want to fail better. I maybe want to succeed, really want to fail better. You can hire me. I'm a data science consultant. I work for lots of companies. I do data science, AI, and machine learning consulting. Um, in particular, I help companies that are growing or starting their data science teams. Um, defining data strategies or building small proof of concepts to validate if ideas are good or not. And you can go to that website. Um, and so, yes, you can hire me. Um, also, if you're like, I wish I knew more about navigating a data science career, then I have good news. Um, I have a book coming out. So me and Emily Robinson, who my understanding is going to be a speaker here in the upcoming months, um, we are co-authoring a book, Build Your Career in Data Science, that really goes through the steps from how do you get the skills to be a data scientist, to nailing an interview, to building your first analysis, to becoming a manager. Um, so you can buy it now, you get the first nine chapters, and then as the rest of the chapters come out, you get them as they, immediately as they come out. But the full book will be available early in 2020, and you can get 40% off if you buy it right now with the Build Book 40 um, at <clears> http <throat> slash slash bestbook.cool. Uh, <laughs> It's very memorable. Uh, and so with that, um, thank you so much.
questions? Hands straight up. Yes, back. First of all, thanks for the talk. Um, one question I had is when you know dealing with failure, it's great to learn it all, but a lot of times it results in very painful and negative consequences, um, especially for other people who have mistakes in your project. How do you manage those consequences of failing and learning? Yeah, okay, so the question was, hey, it's cool to go up and talk about how failure is great, but like failure hurts other people and teams and things like that. And how do you manage the fact that your failure has consequences throughout the organization? So I think that's a great question. And I think it's very hard to do um, because ultimately people are relying on you to do something that you are unable to do. So the best thing you can do about this is try and mitigate the risks through communication, right? Like let people know very early on, hey, we're trying to build this machine learning model we need to do the exploratory analysis to see if it's even feasible. And then after a few weeks, if it seems like it's feasible, like, you know, we will report back on that, right? Like trying to put as many steps along the way as you can of like, hey, and then we're gonna have a check here if we think it works. And then we're gonna have a check here. And so some of the biggest projects I've been on that have failed in ways that really hurt the organization were ones where at the start, like we signed a giant contract and we said, and we will build this model for you and it will work. Right? And what we should have done and what we did in later contracts was say, okay, we're going to have a two month period where we're going to do the exploratory analysis and then we will decide if we want to continue. And so the more you can kind of do these steps of like hedging the risk, um, the easier it is. So it's really coming back to the idea that you don't want to be overconfident and sell everything up front. Like be just very open at the beginning with like, hey, this is exploratory. We're going to try stuff. It'll hopefully work, but if it doesn't, like we need to have a plan for that. Oh yeah, sure. It was. Um, it was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I went too far. Yeah, full customer now. So it was. Yeah, the time I went in front of a presentation really embarrassed myself. Sorry, which one? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so could you elaborate on that? Yeah. You had to work with. You know, you were looking around trying to. Yeah. Yeah. The customer didn't have an idea of what it is that they were hoping you would find, or you didn't have right. the system or something? Exactly. And so this is actually, this is like the top one, but this has happened a number of times in my career. And it generally especially happens with smaller companies who like haven't had data scientists before. They get really hyped up on the idea that their data has value in it. But like that's not really how data works. Right? Really, it's like you have an objective you want to achieve, and data can help you with that, right? So like maybe it's you want your customers to stick around longer. Data can help you understand why, right? You want to blah blah blah. Like you can have a business objective. But companies who don't have data scientists before, they think that data can help them find the objective, right? So like if you look at the data data for long enough, you will notice some secret thing we didn't know about, and that will help us figure out what we should change about our company. And every time a company has come to me with that kind of work, what's ultimately happened was for the most part, I did the thing that happened right here, which is I told them stuff they already knew. So if you don't have an objective, like what are you trying to get out of the data? Like what are the ideas and hypotheses that you think that you can validate or disprove with the data or use the data to do? Then if you don't have that and you want the data to come up with it for you, it like often doesn't work. So, so it's like having a, having a goal for your research to, to shoot at or having them express to you like, you know, what it is they don't know in, in terms of a problem that they're having? Yes, exactly. Yep, exactly. Just analyze for the sake of showing analysis is useful. Like, does not work very well. Yes? Um, following along with that, how do you provide an objective but still, how do you balance that with like not biasing your analysis by going in with like a, a hypothesis that you're trying to prove? Yes, so great question. And so um, the thing I always suggest is you create an analysis plan. Like the, before you actually start the analysis, create a plan. So say our objective is to understand why customers are leaving. Our analysis, the first thing we're going to do is look at it by region. In each region, we're going to create a blah, 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 right? And just come up with a list of steps. And then when you do your analysis, you can go, you, everyone can sign off, yeah, these seem like a good idea. Then when you go through your analysis, you'll be very clean and crisp on, I'm doing stuff that's useful for the problem I'm trying to solve, instead of getting lost in the weeds of like, oh, this seems like it might be interesting someday. And then if it turns out that like you need to adjust your plan on the fly, that's fine. But having that like starting like one page document of like here's everything I want to do before I get started can really lower the risks um, you have of like coming in and then you automatically hype like prove something. You know, yeah, you bias your. I'm saying a lot of words that don't make sense, but uh, you go in and you 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 do something that's biased or flawed. Happening and, uh, <laughs> and nobody talking about it. Um, 
So my question is, you talked about like um, sometimes there's no signal there at all. Um, can you discuss? Can you mention some like sort of simple ways that you can arrive, that you can sort of d determine that there's no signal there before going and building like the most complicated models? Yeah, that's a great question or great request. So how do you um, how can you tell before you invest all the time in if there's going to be a signal or not? And so my general philosophy is that anything a human can be able to tell, a machine learning model will be able to tell. And anything a human can't tell, a machine learning model can't. So if a human can't look at like, a whole bunch of lines of telemetry and have any idea what's going on, a machine learning model probably can't. And if a human can't look at ordering data and would, like, look at a bunch of orders and try and tell, like, tell you, oh, this customer is definitely going to leave, a machine learning model probably can't. So step one is just have a human see if it seems like a, something a human can do. And the other thing is, I've, it's rarely been the case to me that a super complex deep learning whatever model, super complex model works and a simple one doesn't. It's usually a case that the simple one works OK and then the complex one works better. And so what that means is that you should start by trying the simple one really fast. And if that doesn't work, abort. And if it does work, then switch to doing the complicated one. And I see data scientists get hung up on this a lot because you're really excited as a data scientist. You're like, big data set. The first thing I want to do is the super cool neural nets, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, well, you spent two months doing that. And if you'd done a linear regression, you would have noticed that the linear regression didn't work at all. So that pr method probably wouldn't have worked either. That's a good question. So how does the uh, domain industry, the industry and domain knowledge affect the model creation? So that's a good question. For me, it's like it usually doesn't create, affect the model creation as much. It usually affects much more the getting to the point where I'm going to create a model in the first place, right? So like having those conversations with the business people, understanding what their real problems are, understanding how data can solve. That part is where the business knowledge is really useful. And when you finally get to the point where you're like, you know what, it is a good idea to take order data and try and predict which customers are going to leave. When you finally get to that point, it's not as important to understand the details. Like whether or not it's like airplane orders or you know, Nordstrom orders, whatever, like it's usually still like a logistic regression. But the really hard part is figuring out like, hey, does this setting up the data in this way make sense at all? Or should we have not even tried? Like that's for me, I've noticed like that's really where the domain knowledge has helped me out. Last question. Thank you for sharing all of this. this is uh, echoing what was said earlier. This is really cool to hear some of this out loud. Um, going back to the um, retail client and sort of who the real client was, um, can you? Is there anything else that you can say in terms of your your perspective from the outside of an organization, maybe coming inwards and trying to find out who's really making decisions or who's going to help unlock um, what's needed to task? Yeah, you know, it's really hard. And as a consultant, you can e very easily get burned by this by signing on for a project and then like, oh, well, the client won't ever have data because the people who have data don't want to work with you, right? So like those sorts of things really happen. And, um, you know, I don't know if I have a good answer to how to avoid those sorts of situations to find who the real truth holder is. But I do know that, um, it's like at the end of the day, it's all about like negotiation and communication. So it's like, it's like business book stuff, right? Like it's really like it's really a matter of just trying to like be very upfront with the client you're working with and really understand, hey, do you have this data? If you don't, do you know who's going to be able to get it? Can I talk to them? Right? Like really just trying to be very comfortable in no understanding what the risks are upfront, being able to talk to the people involved, and then when you notice, hey, those people are being really uncomfortable, being able to very quickly go back to your first person and being like, hey. Let's have a conversation about that. So, and this is the thing, you know, a fair number of people come up to me and they'll be like, hey, I'm interested in becoming an independent consultant too. And, you know, because I really just want to make, be the person who makes the models and do all that. And like to be an independent consultant is to like 50% of your job is doing that kind of stuff, is doing the conversations, the negotiations, the figuring out what's going on. And so I don't have an easy answer to that, but I do think it's one of those things that you want to continue to do and get practice at and just get better and better because it's just a skill you build up over time like other things. So let's thank uh, Jacqueline not only for taking the red eye here last night, but also, <laughs> but also for showing the, the, uh, her vulnerable side with us too. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. Oh, thank you. Thank you.